real goals, right? I mean, like to do something career-wise. And you're just never going to walk into your boss's office and be like, hey, didn't get that project done. Maybe, you know, you could let me do, have another week or redo it. I mean, it just doesn't happen like that in the real world. So we have to start preparing for that. And I know high schools don't do a good job of that, but we're going to definitely do it here, okay? All right. I'm ready to start. Yes? Okay. I'm going to start covering these notes. And these notes are available to you in Canvas under Course Files. And I'm going to follow these notes. Now, the notes that you are going to look at are going to be static PDF files. So they're just, nothing's going to, you can't move anything around or animate things like I will be able to. But at least you'll be able to kind of follow along. Is that a question? Yes. Yes. So all the notes and all the whole, basically everything that you're going to be teaching us is within those notes and in those videos. Yes. Except for what I'm doing in class, right? Because the videos, are you, are you talking about the course videos that give you an introduction to the topics or our class videos? Everything you do. Yeah, I mean, you have, the only thing you don't have online right now for you is what I do in class. I mean, you have homework, you have an introduction to each topic, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, and then you have the notes to follow. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm getting, what I'm saying is that when we go to these notes, I'm guessing there are problems in there that, that I will do in class. So they're not already done in the notes. They're not done in the notes. That's correct. Yes. So I was kind of going to show you that as we go through this. Um, I do also want to talk, uh, before I jump in, I think it's important for us to kind of like talk about what calculus is about. Have y'all, what have y'all heard about calculus? 70% uh, algebra, 30% calculus. 70% algebra, 30% calculus. Why people go calculus because they don't understand algebra. Have y'all heard that before? Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> calculus is algebra on steroids. I mean, it is. I'll give you a perfect example. Whoa! Look at all these markers. <coughs> I'll give you an example, just to get us started. So there is a polynomial expression x squared minus four. If I asked you to factor that, what would that factor to be? Factored. Okay, so x minus 2, x plus 2. Okay, so that's the factorization of that because that's a difference of squares. All right? So, that's algebra. Okay. x minus 2. Factor that. Right? This is true. This is correct. So this, this is algebra, the way that most of us are somewhat comfortable with. You know, you just take the square root of that, and you get the x, and the square root of that, you get your 2. You look at that, normally in an algebra class, you don't look at that as being a difference of two squares. But you can look at x as being root x, right, squared. And you can look at 2 as being root 2 squared. So you could factor that as a difference of squares. So that's kind of like what I'm saying. We're going to take the algebra and we're going to, we're going to turn it up. Like it's, everything's going to be cranked up from what it was, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so what is calculus about? <clears throat> I'm going to try and summarize. I could sit here for three class periods trying to summarize what calculus is. But I'll do my best to make it as simple as possible. Where's should be a, do y'all see a, oh, there it is. Never mind. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure about the percentage, 70% algebra, 30% calculus, but I've always said that I don't think in Cal 1, I don't think that, that the calculus part is that hard. I think the part of it that's hard is all the algebra that you have to be able to do. Now, there will be some things that are tough, but um, algebra is the biggest hurdle for most students in this class. Yes? Uh, Fair amount. I mean, you need to know what all your trig functions and yeah, 
we'll just kind of see. We always can pull from pre-cal. Like there's always, you know, we can always say, oh, go back. Remember right tri triangles, you know, all that stuff's there. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let me try and give you an idea of the main problem that kind of starts it all out, which is the whole idea of what does this mean? So what's zero divided by zero? So undefined, I've heard undefined, I've heard zero. Any other? One. There's a lot of weird things happening here, right? Like you're always taught that like four over four, that would be one, right? Anything over itself is one. Um, you're also taught that zero divided by any number should be zero, right? But you're also taught that any number divided by zero is undefined, right? So you've got a lot of different things kind of happening here. Do you all see that? So this is undefined, right? It's undefined because we are trying to divide by zero, which is not allowed, right? This is undefined. However, the whole idea of zero over zero comes up <coughs> more times than you would think. So let me give you an example, visual example if I can. Let's say that this is time, and let's say that this is distance. And let's just think about you, you, you driving here to school or getting here today, all right? So we're going to start the clock when you get in your car or whatever and you start driving. So at, at zero time, you've gone zero distance, right? And who cares about the units? This could be seconds, hours, minutes, who cares? So at zero time, we haven't gone anywhere, right? And let's say after a certain amount of time, we'll say, we'll say 20 minutes, all right? We'll make this minutes. Let's say at 20 minutes you finally get to school and let's say you've gone seven miles. All right? Then you can talk about your average speed. What would your average speed be here for your trip? What was the question again? What would your average speed be? So do we know the definition of speed? S speed is the total distance you travel divided by the total time it takes you to go that distance. So I'm sorry, this was average speed, average. I'm abbreviating like crazy here. Average speed is total distance over total time. So what would your total distance have been here? Seven miles, and divided by the total time, which would have been 20 minutes. So seven divided by 20, that's a kind of a nasty number. Who's got their calculator handy? 0 0.35, right? Is that what you got? Close enough, everyone? Miles per minute. That was your average speed. You were traveling at 0.35 miles per minute. Now that's not in miles per hour, which is something we like to, like we're all more comfortable with, but you were going about a third of a mile a minute to get here, right? Yes? Could you essentially also say, <coughs> or solve it in the sense of taking 20 minutes divided by 60 minutes? Without the seven? I'm not sure what you mean. I'm not quite sure what you're doing mathematically, but well, I'm not quite sure that's what he was saying, though. Um, you could convert this to miles per hour by using dimensional analysis. You could do that. I'm not, but that's not, I don't think, what you were saying. Uh, maybe it might have been. I just subconsciously wasn't thinking of it. I was just thinking if it's miles per hour and there's 60 minutes in an hour and we went seven miles in 20 minutes, then I just took 20 divided by 60 and that gave me how fast we were going. Okay. I, I, I think I got what you're, you're saying there. 
Yes, you're, you're just saying because this is a nice increment of time, 20 and you know, 63, you know, goes in there three, you could do a quick little computation, but yeah, you could. All right, let's get back to this though. Your average, your average speed is this over this, right? But geometrically, geometrically, isn't that just the slope of that line? We use m for slope, don't we? Yes. The slope of a line connecting two points is rise divided by run, mm -hmm. right? So your rise here is 7, and your run here is 20. So this computation is the same as the slope of the line connecting the two points. Do we all agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now, I have all these damn markers. I bet you half of them don't work. Okay, so now let's fill in the blanks. Let's say we actually fill in the, you know, at a certain time we went a certain distance. This is your actual path getting yourself to school. Okay, let's say that's what actually happened. At every point in time, we know exactly how far you've gone. Okay, that's different than the green line, right? The green line is an average, isn't it? Okay, but you know that when you're driving to school, you look down at your speedometer at any given time, it's showing you how fast you're going, right? So if I ask you now to pick some point in time here, let's just go with 10, and tell me how fast you were going right there at 10 minutes. What happens? Seven. What's that? Seven, Seven what? Where are you getting that from? That's still average. I, I'm, saying, I'm saying at exactly 10 minutes, you're driving to school, exactly 10 minutes, you look down at your speedometer, it's telling you how fast you're going, right? Yes? Okay, so on my graph, we know that if I, if I know how far I went and how long it took me to go, sorry, how long it took me and how far I went, then I can get the average speed by just calculating the slope of the, the line between the two points, right? But what becomes an issue if I ask you to tell me your speed at an exact instant, at a point in time? See, at a point in time, what happens? 35, 0.35, which is the average speed. You said that's the answer. That's, no, this, okay, this would not be the speed at this particular point. Okay, because, well, I never told you how high this is, right? Mm -hmm. I never told you that. Yes. So, we don't know how, we actually don't know how far we've gone, right? But there's something more fundamental. If I ask you this, how fast you're going, right, at a, at a point in time, what is wrong with this formula? What happens? I'm running, right? So, I'm running here and I say, all right, freeze. How fast am I going right there? What's wrong with your formula? How much distance will I have gone if I'm frozen in time? I haven't gone anywhere, right? How much time has elapsed if I'm frozen in time? Zero. It's impossible for me to figure out the speed at an instant because I require some sort of distance divided by some sort of time period, right? And if you have zero distance and zero time at an instant, then you can't compute it. Does that make sense? Now what you could do is if you picked another point right here next to it, really close, then you could, if someone gave you the information, if you knew how high that was and you knew how high that was, then you could create a little green line right there, couldn't you? And that little line would give you an approximation of how fast you were going at that instant. But it would still be wrong, right? It would still be wrong because it would be an average. It wouldn't be an instant. Are you all following this? So calculus one was developed by two mathematicians, Isaac Newton and, I always forget his first name, I think it's Frederick Leibniz, but I think I'm wrong with the, with the first name. Leibniz and Newton are the two fathers of calculus. Kind of interesting, they developed calculus independently of one another. They didn't know the other one existed. And they did it about the same time in history, which is kind of weird. So they, they kind of absorbed all the math that was known and they went and created calculus from it. And this is one of the fundamental problems that they were trying to get around, is how do we get around this, this idea of having zero divided by zero? <clears throat> is it possible to talk about the speed 
of something at an instant. And you can. But it requires you use something called the limit. You need this thing called the limit. And all of calculus, Cal 1, 2, 3, all of it, differential equations, almost everything that you do from here on out uh, on mathematically is, is rooted right here with this idea of the limit. And that's what we're going to start in 1.3. Today we're going to do 1.1, 1.2, we'll see how much time we have. But I just wanted to kind of give you some basic idea of one of the main problems that we went after, all right? We as humans, we're trying to get around this idea. We know that if something's moving, that at a particular point in time, it should have some sort of speed, right? Now, people have actually argued this, like traffic, tic traffic tickets, you know? Like, you know, you, you get pulled over for going, what, 75 miles per hour? Well, 75 miles per hour is an average speed, right? What if you've only been on the road for three minutes? Like, how can they say you've been going 75 miles per hour? You know, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's been argued in court, and you'll lose. But um, the, the radar gun is what the radar gun that the police officers have does is it shoots a laser to your car and calculates how much time it takes for that to come back, and then shoots another one and take, calculates time to come back. And then they have two points in time and they, they basically are getting these two dots and calculating an average. And if your average speed over that little interval is 75 miles per hour, if that's your average, then you had to have been speeding. Because in that little time, you couldn't have all of a sudden gone from 75 to like 50. You know, it's a small enough increment of time that it would be impossible for you to actually not have been going that fast, if that makes sense. So. We are going to be trying to get, get around this. Trust me, we're going to be able to do it, all right? It's going to be pretty, pretty awesome that we can do it. But it's a very fundamental idea. It's like I just always imagine this guy sitting in this little shed because Newton worked out of almost like a shed in his backyard. I can just see him like trying to figure out how to get around this. And it works, what he came up with. I'll give you one more example. Okay, there's a circle, right? What's the area of a circle? So the area, there's a formula for it, right? If you have the radius, if somebody gives you the radius of a circle, that's an R right there. It's pi R squared. Okay, that's, that's the formula for the area of a circle. So where did this come from? Right? Where did that come from? And in my Cal 2 classes, um, we prove where that, we, we show where that formula comes from. We show where the circumference formula comes from. We show volumes of a, a ball, a surface area of a ball. We prove all the formulas. <clears throat> but they all come from this idea of the limit again. And it's actually kind of crazy how you do it. But you imagine yourself filling up this circle with a square, right? You can find the area of a square, right? Length times width or side times side. So you, you do that, and then you'd fill this little gap in here with a the, with the rectangle, little rectangle in here. You start putting in all these little rectangles. Imagine like having a piece of paper out there and drawing all these rectangles and squares, and then adding them all up. That would get you close, wouldn't it? But you would have a bunch of mistakes, a bunch of error. You'd have all these little gaps in the corners that you weren't able to pick up, right? Agreed? Yes. So then what you do is you draw the circle again, and this time you draw a square around it. And then you say, that's too big, right? That area of this is too big. And then you start subtracting rectangles out of it. And so you're going to get an answer here, and this area is going to be too much. And you get an answer here, and that area is not enough. And you start to squeeze the true area between two numbers. Does that kind of make sense or not? This, this would be a pain in the butt, though, to do, right? Like drawing all these little rectangles and measuring it. Um, but in calculus, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do it this way. We're going we're to take just the top half of the circle, and we're going to start filling it in with rectangles vertically like this and trying to find the area like that. Get the idea? Yeah. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to let the number of rectangles we have in here grow. So we'll start with maybe 10 rectangles, then we'll do 30. And it, the more I get, the, the more narrow they become, right? 
And then eventually what we're going to do is we're going to let the number of rectangles here become infinite. And that's where you're going to have, that's where the limit will come in. So again, it's I'm just trying to get you to see like, like a broad picture, zero over zero and things like this where what we want to do is an infinite number of processes. Algebra is finite. Everything we do in algebra and pre-cal, you do a calculation, you get an answer, right? Do a calculation, you get an answer. Calculus is about doing an infinite number of processes. What if you continue to do this process over and over and over and over forever? What happens? Okay? All right. That's it. I hope that's somewhat makes it somewhat uh, know, exciting. I don't know what, what other word to use. We'll have a lot more to look at, but let's get to the to the notes. And it is warm in here. All right, so this is all review material. One chapter one, section one is review, so I'm going to go through it quickly. All right. So a lot of this is definitions. Don't write this stuff down because it's all here, right? It's all on Canvas. So the first definition of a function. So a function basically takes something in and spits something out, right? Something in, something out. The thing that we plug in, right? Whatever we plug in has to go to only one output. So you can't take, you can't take something into a function and have it spit out two things, all right? So that's what it means to be a function. And then we have these things, you know, the domain. So the domain of a function, in layman's terms, is basically the stuff you can plug in, right? Anything that can be plugged into the function is its domain. So think about the square root function. What can you not plug into a square root function? What can you not take the square root of? Negative, Negative numbers. We can if you bring in imaginaries, but we're not doing that. I mean, I should, I should tell you that. This entire book, imaginary num numbers are not allowed, okay? You want, it, you, you want the imaginary numbers to be here, you have to take a sequence of courses called complex analysis. And that happens after Cal 3, after later algebra. So that comes later, right? So no imaginary numbers in here. Um, so square root function, you can't plug in negatives, right? You can plug in positives, positive numbers. So those positive numbers would be the domain. Can you plug zero into the square root function? Can you take square root of zero? You get zero. So domain are all the things that may be plugged into the function. All right, the range. The range of a function are the things that come out on the other side. All right, so I want you to consider this picture real quick. I think a lot of students have seen this picture, this idea of a function f. Okay, and then you have numbers over here that get taken over here. Y'all seen this like a, like a machine, take something in and spit something out? So let's take, make this function, I'll call it f of x, let's make it the square root of x function. So what happens if I plug 4 into this? Comes through, comes out as what? 2, right? So what if I plug in um, negative 2? That's undefined, right? So this is not in the domain. If this is the domain, dom f is what we usually call it, the negative 2 can't be in here, right? Um, now over here, look at, this, look at this number. How about, how about, uh,